Hi, my name is Patricia Kathleen, and this podcast series will contain interviews I conduct with women, female-identified, and non-binary individuals regarding their professional stories and personal narrative as it relates to their perspective. This podcast is designed to hold a space for all individuals to learn from their counterparts, regardless of age, status, or industry. We intend to transparently investigate the evolving global dialogue regarding underrepresented figures in all industries across the USA and abroad. By hosting these stories and conversations, we aim to contribute to the changing platform and representation of these individuals for the future. Now let's start the conversation. Hi everyone and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I'm sitting down with Scout Sobel. Scout is the founder of Scout's Agency and a podcast host of Scout Podcast and OK Sis. You can find out more about her and her podcast on scoutsobel.com. That is S-C-O-U-T-S-O-B-E-L.com. Welcome, Scout. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I look forward to kind of unpacking everything. We have a lot of um, similar alignments between um, the ethos of what we do at Patricia Kathleen Podcast and what you're doing over there. So I can't wait to kind of unpack what you're doing. I will read a bio on Scout for everyone listening. Prior to that, however, I'm going to give you a brief roadmap of today's podcast. We will first look at unpacking Scout's academic history and brief professional past to kind of garner a platform of where she's coming from. And then we will look at unpacking um, Scout's agency and look into to some of the ethos of around her podcasts, the guests she has on, where she thinks she's headed with that. Then we'll turn our efforts towards looking at some of the goals that Scout may have over the next one to three years. Those have been changing um, given today's climate a great deal for most of the people we've been talking to. And then we'll wrap everything up with talking about advice that Scout may have for those of you who are looking to get involved, follow her, or um, maybe emulate some of her success. A quick bio on Scout. Scout Sobel is the founder of Scout's Agency and the host of Scout Podcast and a co-host of OK Sis Podcast. After starting OK Sis, which focuses on female guests, Scout fell in love with spreading women's stories. She started Scout's Agency with an emphasis in podcast PR to do just that with 90% of her clients being women. She built Scout's Agency uh, to a revenue of six figures in her first year and has represented key figures in the industry such as Kat Sadler, Kathy Heller and Bala. She, uh, this did not come without her own trials and tribulations. Scout has been living with a severe case of bipolar disorder for 14 years and experiences a plethora of symptoms such as depression, anxiety, hypomania, catonia, catatonia, and psychoses. She once was unable to hold a job, go to school, or function in today's society. With a lot of self-development work, therapy, and garnering up tools in her toolbox, Scout manages her bipolar disorder successfully and uses her mental strength that she has created in herself to fuel her entrepreneurial dreams. And Scout, I really appreciate and I love that kind of personal paradigm. I think a lot of um, bios, people kind of leave out the impetus for um, the backbone of what they're doing. And I'm, I'm excited to kind of climb through some of that as you see fit to share it. But before we get to unpacking um, you and Scout's agency, I'm wondering if you can draw us a quick background of what your academic and early professional life looked like. Yeah, so my academic life was a total mess. I went to Berkeley City College with the um, intent on transferring to UC Berkeley, but the City College was very isolating. It was not a campus, it was just a building. And so it was hard to find a sense of community there. So I decided to transfer to Sarah Lawrence College in New York, which is a very alternative method of academic. Um, There's no grades, there's no majors, uh, there's no tests, everything's essays and I'm a writer. So that really spoke to my soul. Um, But unfortunately, while I was there in my second year, early junior year, I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder and had to drop out and come home to go through a plethora of treatments. And then once I started kind of feeling a little bit better, I went back to the city college in Orange County just to get my prerequisites done to transfer to a UC um, just to kind of finish out in the cheapest way possible. And it was during that time that I started a magazine and uh, it ended up being sold in Barnes and Noble and newsstands across the country. And we had Halsey on our third cover. And um, yeah, it was amazing. I was about 23-ish at that time. And 
um, I got into UCSD. And so I moved back to San Diego, went to UCSD. And in that time, um, a woman had bought into the magazine and together we were rebranding it as a women's digital media site. And so I actually dropped out of college to pursue that full time when I only had two semesters left. And I have not gone back to school since. And I have just been kind of forging my entrepreneurial path um, until this has gotten me to this moment with Scouts Agency. That's fascinating. Did Scouts Agency get formed kind of in that moment of learning from that woman that it sounds like you went to kind of um, learn under? Yeah, it really taught me a lot of business acumen and how to set up a company really quickly. Um, we were definitely hustling pretty fast to get certain things launched. And so when the idea of Scouts Agency came to me, I had the confidence that I could launch something on a big scale and execute pretty quickly. So I definitely learned a lot from that experience, 100%. It shaped the way I do business today. Nice. Let's unpack Scouts Agency. So let's start with like the nuts and bolts. So the who, what, when, where, why, how. So when was it launched? Did you have co-founders? Was it just you? And did you take any funding? Yes. So I launched it in February of 2019. Um, I launched it after working with a podcast PR agency for my podcast, OK Sis, and having really underwhelming results and having to actually step in and do the work for them in order to fill a trip to New York where we were interviewing. You were supposed to interview 10 women and, and nothing was booked. So I jumped in like a week before and just did it all myself and kind of felt this thrill from it. And another kind of girl at the same time that I knew was like, you should really help other podcasters. And so the wheels were turning and it was starting to brew. And when I had the idea to launch Scouts Agency, it really wasn't formulated in the sense that I had no business plan. I really had no expectations. All I did was essentially narrow down my three services, which was booking guests on people's podcasts. So today we've booked Brian Grazer, Jillian Michaels, Sophia Moroso, Byron Katie, Randy Zuckerberg, Pig, Big, Amy Porterfield, really big guests like that. And then the second service um, was doing podcast tours. So I recognized that the PR world was trending towards podcasts and that people wanted to be on podcasts like they would a book tour. So I represent individuals that want to be a guest on podcasts. And then I just threw in traditional PR in there because I thought maybe podcasters would want that. And I had gotten OK System Press. And so I had my graphic designer that I knew from my magazine create this media kit for me. I don't know, probably paid him a hundred bucks, probably put in a total of $150 to start. And I just emailed the first like six months, I emailed up to 2000 podcasters and people that I wanted to represent. And from there garnered up a clientele of 10 people by uh, like June or July of 2019. And um, in June, I quit my full-time job that I was working at the time, um, went all in. I'm, I'm quite a risk taker in the sense that I probably did it too early, um, but everything I do is pretty early because I have a sense of urgency that my energy just carries me toward ex execution. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then in August, I hired my first employee. In September, I opened an office and um, we hit a six-figure revenue in our first year. Congratulations. That's fantastic. So I'm wondering, I, uh, clarify for everyone listening who isn't in the podcast world, you're serving as an agent for people who want to appear to promote services, products, books, all of those types of things on podcasts. But it also sounds like you do a little bit of reverse as, as well. Can you kind of like parse out the different aspects or the services that your agency provides? Yeah, for sure. So um, the first service is, let's say you have a podcast and you want to interview, you know, kind of dream list reach people. Uh, you would essentially come to me and I would book out your show with um, different types of people, whether it's entrepreneurs, female led, whatever your brand may be. So I book out your podcast with guests and help schedule. The second service I do is a podcast tour where I get individuals on a plethora of podcasts. So you don't have to have a podcast. You can be an author. You can be an entrepreneur. You can be a musician. You can be a celebrity nutritionist. And we essentially set you up as guesting on a bunch of podcasts. We average about four opportunities a month for our clients. And then our third service is traditional PR. So you know, the basics, we get our clients in Vogue, Marie Claire, Who, What, Where, BuzzFeed, Forbes, Entrepreneur, all of that stuff. And that's really where we've started to work with more female run brands and businesses versus um, solopreneurs that want to be on podcasts. 
Now, when you were setting up your business model, there's a lot of different ways that you can come at that. You know, um, for everyone listening, I know that there are a lot of different business owners and founders out there. You can do relationship building, you can do sponsorship, just because you have a different kind of dynamic with each person. What made you decide to go with which model you had? Do you have a subscription-based model? Does it depend on which client you have? How is all of that set up? And what made you decide to set that up as a founder? Yes. So in the beginning, I set it up quite loosely in the sense that they were completely month to month contracts. I felt as if I needed to prove myself first before finding clients that could sign on for a certain amount at a certain flashy price point. And so I proved myself first. I did month to month contracts. So people would think, well, what do I have to lose? It's one month if it doesn't work out. And then would well then and they would love me and we would work together and I would produce the you know tangible results and then they would keep signing on and so once I saw that there was potential for clients to resign and that I was performing and executing and delivering results I essentially um, started moving to three-month contracts just so I could get a little bit more stability and reliability in my yeah. revenue projections and all that stuff and then now only a year later are we now signing six month contracts. So I really took the approach of let me prove myself, let me prove my work, let me get my track record in order, and then I can up my contracts, up my prices based upon the value that I have historically provided for my clients. Yeah. And it's interesting. I think you're one of the first people I've run across that is, you know, her endeavors and, and business foundership is within the podcast industry, but you're also... Um, you're a podcaster yourself. And so yeah. it gives you kind of that insider's point of view, which I think is really unique um, in, in being able to answer to your client's needs and really understand even perhaps before they do what, what they need and what they are looking at and kind of position, you know, podcasting in and of itself doesn't necessarily help one get the word out. It's, it's strategically which podcast, what's their reach. Podcasts can be incredibly small, but if the reach is to the right micro influencers, it's, it's the biggest deal in the world, you know, as, as all PR and marketing is boiled down to these days. But um, I kind of want to unpack how looking at your podcast, well, first of all, did, um, which one came first? You have two separate ones, correct? Yes. And which so, one came first? Um, okay, Sis came first. I launched Scout Podcast, I think, like two months ago, maybe. Okay. And okay, Sis, can you tell us like what it speaks to? What was like the kind of the ethos of launching it? Yeah. So I actually had my own podcast two years ago and I lived next to a podcast studio that was attached to a produce warehouse, like so random. And I knew all the girls cause I shopped at the produce center all the time. And I said, yo, can I get in there? And they had one more spot left and I jumped on and it was kind of an experiment in their mind. It was totally free. They just wanted to jump into the podcast game and see how it would work for their business model. And I didn't really treat it like a business. It wasn't growing. My numbers were low. I wasn't gaining new listenership and something about it just felt stale energetically. And then um, long story short, I was at the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa with my sister getting massages and kind of, you know, two rosés deep. Mm -hmm. And I had, I didn't have a podcast for the next week. So I said, yo, you want to hop on the podcast, Mads, my sister? And she said, yeah. So we went to the business center and we just recorded on my phone and we were talking about the bachelor and pop culture and my other podcast was a lot more serious about mental health and um, I had so much fun and the energy was flowing and so two weeks later I texted her and I was like we got to do something together what is it and I said let me stop my podcast and then start okay sis with my sister essentially um so I we launched in two weeks of deciding to do this and we decided to focus on women specifically females yeah because we really were really um interested in that thing and my little doggy is crying my husband's gonna come get her she is like freaking out i don't know why it's a uh, podcast it's the it's like kismet it's always it's always meant to happen during podcasts she, like never cries literally okay <laughs> so she's gone um so we decided to launch with women because we really have always kind of identified in the female space 
highlighting female stories. The projects I had worked on before, the digital media site was all women based. And we just wanted to have like this intimate, vulnerable girl chat time where we could talk to entrepreneurs and influencers, not only about how they got to where they got in a really serious way, but we're silly. Like we have sisterly banter. We tell ourselves to fuck off all the time. I mean, it's a good time, right? Like we're Mm. having a good time. And so um, through that, we have garnered the most incredible sisterhood of listeners and it's been wild. It's been so rewarding. Absolutely. It sounds like that kind of authenticity is is always in need. When did you guys launch OKSIS? We launched OKSIS in August 2019. um, And we've kind of tapped into a certain influencer sphere. We've gotten big YouTubers on like Lauren Elizabeth and Kenzie Elizabeth. We've gotten Bachelor reality stars, Amanda Stanton, Cassie Randolph. And then we've also gotten big bloggers like Lauren Everts, Bostick, and Sivan Ayla, model Charlotte McKinney, and then also a bunch of entrepreneurs that started Set Active and Dead Cool and Facile and, you know, small female run businesses. So it's been kind of a really great mix of women. That's exciting. And it sounds like it parlays really well into, you know, the, the work you're doing for your clients. Let's turn um, attention now to Scouts, your, your other podcast with a more serious tone. When was that one launched? So I launched that, I think like the first week of quarantine, two months ago, it was something that I really wanted to launch because with OKSIS, the brand is definitely my sister and my relationship and our silly banter and having fun and talking about pop culture and what we're reading. And it's it's very inspiring and we touch upon really inspiring stuff, but at the same time, it is very silly and lighthearted and it is very much who my sister and I are together, which is beautiful and has really brought me out of my shell. But there was a part of me that was like, you know, I've walked through a little bit of a hell with my bipolar disorder. I have been hospitalized. I have psychosis. I have had suicidal ideation. And there's a part of me that has recovered from that and has so much to say just regarding that. And I didn't want to bog OKSIS down with that because that wasn't the brand. And that wasn't my sister's experience. So I started Scout Podcast. It is not an interview-based podcast. It is just solo episodes. I do not run it the same way I run OKSIS. OKSIS is very consistent and regimented and like we have an interview and you know, it's, it's very consistent and run like a business. Scout Podcast is like, I have an emotional feeling and I get on the mic and I ramble for 20 minutes and it's almost like a therapy of me purging out all my thoughts, emotions, and not only that, but also giving people tangible ways to get rid of anxiety, to curate their lives, to understand that mental health and entrepreneurship goes super hand in hand. So, I mean, if you listen to me on both, you find very different energies and very different aspects of my personality because I believe that we are multifaceted human beings and there is a place for different topics at different times. And so Scout Podcast was born just out of, I needed to purge the last 14 years of my life and tell people how I did it essentially. It's brave. I mean, it's, it's unusual. It's not unusual to have, you know, people want to put their life out there. It's that's done ad nauseum and has been for the past decade and a half, but very few people want to take the filter off, you know, and, and talk about even in this day and age of difficulty, like there's still like a really pretty side put on difficult things. And so it's, it's, um, you call it therapeutic, but I also think that it's incredibly brave. Like when you went to do it, were you nervous or did you just think this is something I need to do now? Um, when I had my first podcast two, two and a half years ago, I decided to come out with my bipolar disorder and I said things that even my really close friends didn't know. Like Mm -hmm. I have some really scary psychosis problems and, um, I was terrified. I cried throughout the whole episode and I released it. And the minute I released it, I was free. Everybody knew everything about my brain. There was no reason to hide anymore. There was nothing to hide. And so then I got really comfortable talking about it. I talk about it on OK Sis all the time. Um, My sister jokes that like every time I say I'm bipolar, our audience has to take a shot of tequila because I say it so many times. I mean, I tell the barista, I tell anyone who wants to listen to me. So yeah, I have gotten really comfortable being vulnerable in the sense that why people call it brave, but I don't understand why it's brave just to be who I am. Like this is what I am and this is what I've been dealt with. And so to not talk about it you know, dips it with a layer of shame, but I just recorded an episode where I just needed to talk to myself. Like personally, I needed to talk to myself. So I got on the mic and I was talking to the listener or whatever. And I said, guys, I got to talk to myself real quick. And I closed my eyes and I just talked to myself and I forgot there was a mic 
and I forgot all those things and I just said the things I needed to emotionally hear to make me strong and insp inspired. And people DM'd me and they were like, I needed to hear the same thing. So I think that we oftentimes think that sharing alienates us or makes us seem other than or makes us seem different. But even with people that don't have bipolar disorder, you can relate to my struggles. We are all human. So um, people call it you know, vulnerable and strong and brave and whatever, but I just don't know how else to be. That's good. Well, and I think we need more of that, you know, sharing candid. You and I were talking off the record before we started the podcast and you proposed, proffered one of the most common questions I have, which is how much editing do you do? And I was like, none. You dropped the F-bomb. I'm leaving it in there because authenticity is lost, you know, and I know that the Gen Zers and Gen I coming up after them are like craving it and they're like, take off your Instagram filters. Like everybody is now like, stop being all done up. Like, stop it. It's not real. And that, you know, the boom of the micro influencer was like, we're done looking at the Kardashians, like that fake, weird, generated. And I think that that is part of it. And so I, everyone has the urge to share. It's just that when we start looking at the humanism behind that, you know, it's, it's when it starts to become really interesting. And I think it's just starting to take off. There's been, I don't know how many ads in the past two years, female generated ads where they're removing makeup, they're removing this idealistic body type and all these things. Finally in 2020, you know, we're getting these representations of what real people look like instead of this glossed over thing. And I think that goes, most people don't take it as far into mental um, health and just, you know, those kinds of attributes and just being very, very real with what it looks like and, um, and human. I think a lot of people hear mental health terms and think that that's the other, you know, there's healthy and other, and we're, it's a spectrum. It's like sexuality. It's just insane that, you know, that we would classify or be scared of it. And so I think that educating people as you do and doing that is inclusivity and it is transparency. And that is still, and always will be a little brave as anyone from a third world um, dictatorship country will tell you. <laughs> you yeah. know? So I, I like I, that. I'm blessed in that way that I'm able to speak my truth and not have anyone come after me. Yeah. Or, and likewise, or if they, want to, they can, I don't really care. <laughs> right. Well, there's plenty of haters, but likewise, yeah. so, so is your audience, you know, gifted yeah. with your just um, autonomy and um, vibrant honesty. But um, I want to turn towards, I love talking to people about this right now. And it's not because um, I love talking about the carnage of the COVID-19 pandemic or anything like that. But I do believe in constantly having a dialogue with oneself about where not only one's business, but one's personal life is at. I'm all about this constant re-questioning re about, you know, do I really even believe in algebra? Let's go back and look at it. You know, all of those things, like I just believe in that life of the mind and always going back in and reevaluating. And so when you look at your goals over the next one to three years for Scouts Agency, as well as for yourself personally, I don't know if the two ever co coincide or intertwine and then separate again or how that works, but did you ever make goals? I know you said you jumped in really quickly. You were all in very fast and things like that. But if you do make goals for Scouts Agency and you have done so for the next one to three years, what are they? Like, what do they look like and have they changed? Yeah, so a big goal this year was to sort of, in the beginning, I only represented podcasts. So I only got podcasters on other podcasts. I only booked, you know, podcast shows. And then I did PR for podcasters. And after I proved my worth in that, my goal this year was to really expand and do more traditional PR and podcast PR for brands and companies and businesses. And so I've been able to hit the, those goals. A lot of um, my new clients are brands like Bala, LA Collective. Um, so that's been really amazing. I'm in talks with a few other brands right now. And so that was one of my main goals for the first half of this year was to really tap into that. Um, my second goal was longer contracts, which I'm starting to, my latest contracts have been signed at the six month mark, which feels really great. And usually it's just revenue goals in the sense that every month I want to be hitting a new revenue goal or every two months I want to be hitting a new revenue goal. And I don't put wild expectations on myself. I increase it by, you know, a small percentage every month, just so I don't grow too quickly for my own sake and sanity. Um, another goal, personal goal that feeds into the business goal is hiring somebody to assist me in my daily work. Um, especially as the business is growing, I'm entering, like I'm doing more podcasts, I'm on more sales calls, I'm really doing the marketing and, and the organization and the finances and the structure. And so I'm, 
you know, less in the weeds of the pitching and all that stuff, but I'm still doing that too at the same time. So my next goal is to really restructure the company so that I can be more of a leader versus in the business at all times, working more on the business. And so that kind of freedom to give me the opportunity to lead at a higher level um, is definitely one of my personal goals so that I can structure my days differently as well as my business goals for Scouts Agency. Nice. Yeah. What is your darling right now? Like, what is your favorite? Does it depend on industry or do you have like a social media platform? So there's two different things. You have the, the PR you're providing for your clients and then you have the PR that you're providing for yourself for Scouts Agency. What are your two favorite socials to be able to contact or do most of your marketing on right now? Uh, definitely the two that I work with, podcasts and traditional PR. I yeah. think, you know, a lot of people do Instagram stuff, but I think that is just the, the messaging has been lost a little bit on Instagram. Um, it's been a little bit desensitized. Um, yeah. not, I don't want to say the word saturated because I don't believe in saturation, but I think that just the way it's been utilized, it's been diluted a little bit from its meaning. And so I think that podcasts are so phenomenal because it's intimate, it's long form. People can leave understanding who you are, who your, what your ethos is, what the challenges you've gone through, what you, what your goals are. I mean, you see Scott's agency and you see a business, but when you listen to a podcast like this, you see me as a person who's working behind it. And so I think right. that is such a beautiful new way for people to get their message across. Yeah. What do you, you don't believe in saturation? I got to pull on that thread. What does that mean? I don't believe in saturation as an excuse to not enter a space. Yeah. I believe that there is, it's crowded and it can be saturated, but that does not mean that there are not opportunities still alive in any sort of medium um, to grow as a company, to grow as an influencer, to grow as a brand. Um, there are constantly people looking for new things. I just think that perhaps the messaging that influencers and brands provides on Instagram, such as a brand deal, et cetera, might get lost. You know, 10 years ago, if you did a brand deal with Forever 21, it was a huge impact and you got all these followers. Now you do a brand deal with Zara or whatever, and you don't get as many followers. It's just a little bit of a harder, it's a harder thing to reach. Um, but I do not believe that one should not get into that game because it is saturated. Um, I think when I started OKSIS podcast, my sister said the podcast game saturated. This was a year and a half ago. She's like, the podcast game is saturated. What do I have to say? We're never going to, you know, find our way through all the other voices. And I said, well, yeah, with that attitude, we're not. Mm -hmm. And then we started and we have a very loyal audience that, you know, we're in contact yeah. with all the time. So you know, I don't believe you shouldn't do things if it's saturated, but I do believe you should, that there's so many plethora of mediums available that you should figure out where you're best suited for your brand message. Absolutely. And I have to say that um, as a former art historian, some of the most beautiful um, creative endeavors from developing new, um, you know, computer programs that write gorgeous software to an oil canvas come in crowded spaces. You know, it pushes creativity and it pushes those minds, those brilliant, beautiful minds that create this like, and when you have these limiting confinements, I just spoke with an architect last week and she was like, I do well with like limitations. Mm. She was like, you give me an open plot and say, do whatever. And she was like, I'm going to create the most boring piece of my life. And she was like, but you know, when someone's like, it's got to fit here, it's got to have this, this, and this. And she was like, it's like those sometimes what confines the, the mind breaks out the human spirit of creativity and inspiration. So there's that to be said for saturation. I like that. I like that opinion. I love opinions. I love women with opinions. And I like <laughs> the idea that you don't believe in the saturation being a deterrent. Um, I'm wondering, so um, we're wrapping up right now. We're kind of coming to my favorite piece of the podcast However, um, with you, I want to make sure I really hone it in because you give your advice a lot on your podcast and things like that. So what I'm going to try and glean from you is something that you haven't shared to date, which may be hard because you've been talking on air for a few years now. But I'm curious if a woman or a non-binary or female identified, pretty much anyone other than an identified male cisgendered man walked up to you and said, Listen, um, I've, I've done a lot in the, you know, in the PR industry and the podcast situation, and I think I'm going to start this agency. I'm going to go all in. I want to do this podcast. I have this idea about what it's about. I also want to help other podcasters, essentially someone looking to do exactly what you do two years ago. 
and knowing what you know now, what would you give that individual? What are your top three pieces of advice you would give them when they came to ask you for like core tenets of how to guide themselves? Yeah. Um, one would be emotional boundaries around clients, understanding that just because a client pays for you, that doesn't mean that you are their 24 seven person. Um, that's why you have a lot of clients so that you don't necessarily run into that. And then, um, the second would be the outreach. The, it's a numbers game in the sense that the more you put out, the more you'll get in and always think that you have to put out more than you think you do. So I literally emailed a thousand podcasters within three weeks of starting the company. My email was blocked. They thought it was spam. I opened up another email figure it out and put the energy in. And then the third would be don't necessarily listen to a blueprint, but listen to your energy. I am not formally trained in PR. I'm not formally trained in agency building, but I always did the next right thing. I always looked at the next step in front of me, no matter how big or small. And I said, how do I want to complete this next step? How do I want to complete this next task? And then I thought about how to do it. That made the most sense. So trust yourself. You know what makes sense. You're smart. You got it. You don't need, you know, a blueprint or anything. You just need to think, okay, how can I execute on this service in the best way possible? What makes the most sense? What's the best organizational way here? What, what fuels my soul? And check in with yourself and make sure you build your business based off your energy and where it flows. Because if it's not you personally are going to be very unhappy. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, so I've got emotional boundaries around clients, set those up early and fast uh, so that they don't run your life. Out, um, outreach is a numbers game. You always have to put out more than you get back in or more than you think that you need to put out and listen to your energy um, and not a blueprint as to how you're guiding your mission. I agree with that. And I think that um, rule breakers and um, people who were classically trained as a musician and then became software architects make far more interesting software architects. You know, I think that people who aren't trained classically in what they do come at that industry with such beautiful and unique standpoints. So um, I, I completely agree with everything. And, and it cannot be stated enough because I think a lot of people are told, particularly women and non-binary individuals are told like, what business do you have here? You know, even if you are perfectly trained in that, let alone if that isn't your background. Um, and so always feeling defensive doesn't create the most um, lustrous um, outside facade unless you qualify that, what business do any of us have here? <laughs> we all have the same business. Honestly, you 100% have business here. And if someone doesn't think that, fuck them and start your own thing. There's room yeah. for you. There, you. You have your own thing. You got it. All that stuff that people say to you, don't give it two thoughts. Don't give it energy. Don't let it have power over you. It doesn't, yeah. it, it just only put things in your brain that serve you. If everything you do serves you, you will move forward in a beautiful way, in a fulfilling way. It might be hard with challenges, but anything that doesn't serve you, just get rid of it. It's not yeah, it. I agree. And it's, there's nothing more, um, more a waste of time for me than, you know, than someone yeah. having to clarify their own genius. So mm -hmm. I'm always telling people that as well. Scout, we are out of time, but I wanted to say thank you so much for your insight today. Um, I really appreciate your honesty and, and your, and your candor, even though you take that to be status quo, um, I find it to be unique. And so I want to say thank you. And thank you for sharing all of your information about your company. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. For everyone listening, we've been talking to Scout Sobel. You can find her at www.scoutsobel.com, scoutsobel.com. And until we speak again next time, remember to stay safe, stay in, and always bet on yourself. Slancha.